And then I would take it to my lab and I would completely destroy it. You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you from the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. I'm John Panny Fisher and I'm joined by the regular co-hosts of Ricky Bahir and Marissa Lowe. And this week, uh, all the way from uh, Switzerland in Zurich at, eight, at ETH, is Alison Hunt. How's it going? Hi. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm, co- I'm good. Thank you. And you? Excellent. No, not too bad. Thanks. So actually, firstly, what, what does ETH actually stand for? Oh, <laughs> I'd, I'd gone off <laughs> and shafts. Hox, uh, Technische Hochschule. Oh, that was awful. I can ask in Schaft and Technische Hochschule. <laughs> That's what I would have uh, guessed. I've always wondered it's that. German, <laughs> it's German for uh, like um, state uh, technical high school. So it's okay. a, it's a, it's um, a, the equivalent of a university or, or kind mm-hmm. of like a, a polytechnic in a way. It only does science degrees. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's one of the main sort of people in the audience may not be familiar. I guess it's one of the main sort of research centres in, in in Switzerland, I suppose, isn't it? It is. That's true. Yeah, uh, and we do lots and lots of, of research in lots and lots of scientific disciplines, mm. and uh, it's a very nice place to work in that it's got very good labs and facilities and uh, and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, and I guess that sort of fits quite well for you. Then I suppose you, you would describe yourself as a geochemist. I guess. Yes, I'm definitely a geochemist. Yeah, I started off as a terrestrial geochemist as well, and it's only kind of a little bit later in my uh, my career, kind of post PhD, that I really became a cosmochemist and started mm. working mainly with with meteorites. Yeah, I guess that's a familiar story to a lot of people, isn't it? Really, I um, think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, what what kind of meteorites do you work on specifically then at the moment? So mainly at the moment, I work on iron meteorites, and they've been my focus for the last couple of years. But I do um, work with chondrite meteorites as well, for example. So I do lots of different things on a, on a daily basis. And I also uh, supervise a couple of students as well. So they, they do things which are kind of complementary to me, but a little bit off to the side as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And I guess one of the big things that you're interested in, I guess, is sidrophile elements then, I suppose. Yes, that's true. So a lot of my work in the the last few years has focused on uh, measuring the isotopic composition of iron meteorites for both platinum and palladium. So, yeah, uh, and I generally have an interest in in other siderophiles as well. So at the moment, I work with a student uh, and we work looking at um, iron isotopes, but in chondrites rather than iron meteorites. Okay, that's really cool. Then, so so, what kind of things then do, do the siderophile elements can what, what can they tell us about iron the meteorites? Si- the siderophile elements, yeah, they're, they're super cool elements to work on. So, I mean, they they do tell us a lot about um, well, when I look at them, uh, I'm looking for information mainly about iron meteorites. And what we want to try and understand is when and how the iron meteorites formed. Mm. So our siderophiles give us a a huge clue to this because, of course, they are siderophile elements. That means they're iron loving. And so they're concentrated in the cores of our early formed planetesimals and asteroids. And our iron meteorites are our fragments which come from those early formed cores. So some of the interesting information that we can get out of iron meteorites is, for example, when they formed. And that's really key for us for understanding how the first planetesimals in the solar system formed. And we have a, a, a number of ways to do this using our short-lived chronometers. So short-lived chronometers, for example, include the hafnium tungsten system, uh, where hafnium is going to decay to, t- uh, to tungsten. And that tungsten is concentrated in the the metal part of our Mm -hmm. early form planetesimals. Uh, So this gives us a way to to kind of date the formation of these cores, because tungsten and hafnium are are, uh, separated from each other, fractionated from each other during core formation processes. This is super interesting for us because it's uh, enabled us to to find out that the cores of these these bodies, these asteroids and planetesimals, they often formed really, really early. Mm-hmm. So, so these asteroids are undergoing this, this kind of core mantle differentiation process within the first one to two, maybe three million years after the formation of calcium aluminium rich inclusions, which are the earliest formed solids in our solar system. 
And what that means is if those bodies are already undergoing their core mantle differentiation within the first couple of million years after CAI is formed, then those bodies themselves must be accreting much, much earlier than that even. Mm -hmm. And so we think that the first um, parent bodies of the iron meteorites accreted as little as 0.4 million years after uh, the formation of CAIs. So these are really some of the earliest formed bodies, which makes them super interesting to look at. That's really cool. I guess also, I suppose that must tell us something about the size of these kind of bodies in terms of how, how rapidly they were accreting at that yeah, time as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we can model how, uh, how they have formed um, and based on how large we think we were, uh, Based on how large we think they were, we can look at what times of formation that we think they should have. So what times of core mantle differentiation should they have? And we can track that back to what time uh, the accretion should be for these bodies. So we can definitely try and work out things like how big they were. Yeah. But uh, they do do oh, radioactive isotopes add any complication to trying to figure, figure those the sizes out? Because obviously it depends how much radiation you have. I guess that's not the best word of it, the wording of it, but the quantity of radioactive isotopes will affect that heating that allows for the differentiation process. Yeah. So that's right. That's something that we have to take into account when we do these models. So a lot of the heating for this core mantle differentiation is driven by uh, the decay of aluminium, for mm -hmm. example. So the, uh, the, the concentration of aluminium in the body is going to have a, a large effect on that. So aluminium really strongly heats these bodies within the first kind of five million years of the solar system formation. After that, that's all of the aluminium uh, 26 has decayed away and uh, that's no longer so important as a heating mechanism. Uh, another um, mechanism for heating which can be important is impact. So mm. impact driven heating is very important in the early solar system. But we have a problem when we try to use these chronometers. So for example, the hafnium tungsten system. Uh, and this is especially a problem for iron meteorites. And that's that iron meteorites spend a long time traveling through space before they reach the Earth. So after they're smashed off their parent bodies, some of them have spent up to a billion years traveling through space before they've actually arrived on the Earth. And all the time that they're traveling through space, they're exposed to galactic cosmic rays. So galactic cosmic rays are highly energetic particles. Uh, some are created uh, by our sun in our solar system, but as their name suggests, uh, many of them are, are created outside of our, our solar system or originate outside our solar system. And these galactic cosmic rays or GCR, they're really um, a big problem for us because what they do is they change the isotope uh, ratios that we want to measure in our samples. So when we get a meteorite and we take it to the lab, for some isotope systems, what we're measuring at this point now doesn't actually reflect what um, the the starting composition of that rock was before it began its journey to the earth mm -hmm. and this is where platinum isotopes which i've spent a lot of time measuring really uh, show their usefulness so platinum isotopes are also really really strongly affected by galactic cosmic rays um, and so we can use them as a, a dosimeter so we can look at them and say, OK, well, this platinum isotope ratio shows this offset relative to our terrestrial standards. And we know that with platinum, all of that offset is related to exposure to galactic cosmic rays. Mm -hmm. And so we can compare what we measure for platinum isotope ratios with what we measure, for example, in our chronometers. So, for example, what we measure with tungs uh, in tungsten isotope ratios and we can use the relationship between platinum and tungsten to work out what would be the initial uh, composition of the tungsten isotope uh, ratio, what the uh, tungsten isotope ratio initially was before that exposure to galactic cosmic rays. That's incredible. That's amazing. Yeah. 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 Like I'd heard about hafnium and tungsten and how that system was used to understand these sorts of processes, but I didn't realize that platinum played a role in that as well? Yeah, it does definitely for iron meteorites like this. Um, before we really appreciated the extent of galactic cosmic ray effects in iron meteorites, um, it was possible 
uh, we, we've measured, you know, of course, people have been measuring tungsten isotope ratios and, and looking at them in terms of chronology for some time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was possible to come up with dates for the iron meteorites, which were earlier than the formation of CAIs, which of course, you know, doesn't really make much sense in mm -hmm. our understanding of the solar system. If our CAIs are the earliest formed objects, then we couldn't understand why for tungsten isotopes, some meteorites gave these, these ages earlier than than the, the formation of CAIs. But once we understood that there was this galactic cosmic ray effect, which would also yeah. need to be corrected for, uh, and we were able to uh, establish dosimeter systems like platinum isotopes, for example, suddenly we can make those data make sense. What we're looking at is the chronology information plus the effect of galactic cosmic rays. And we need to subtract to get in that galactic mm -hmm. cosmic ray effect before we can actually say something meaningful yeah. about the age of these bodies and their, their times of differentiation. Yeah, that's really interesting. Cause I, I guess like when, when I hear like galactic cosmic rays, I, of, I often think, you know, noble gases, I guess. So, I mean, and I suppose a lot of the literature mostly focuses on that is there a lot of information about how um, cosmic rays interact them with with platinum and stuff or have you had to sort of build all that initial groundwork uh, from 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 the base up i suppose so i was really lucky when i started to work with platinum isotopes uh, there had been uh, some modeling and the kind of preliminary studies to, to first show the effects that this correction would have to ion meteorites had just been published. Mm. And so this was a, a kind of a really exciting thing to get into. Um, those papers came out in 2013. So before that, there wasn't so much knowledge of the effect that mm. galactic cosmic rays would have on for example, tungsten isotopes, although it was beginning to be, uh, it was suggested that there would be a correction to make for it. The corrections were still at that point, not quite adequate enough to really give us good chronological information. And then uh, these, these papers were published in 2013 and they worked towards uh, est establishing platinum isotopes as one dosimeter for correcting these galactic cosmic ray effects. There are other dosimeters you can use. So for example, another siderophile element, osmium, has also been used uh, for a similar purpose to, to use as a dosimeter um, to correct these galactic cosmic ray effects. Mm. Um, and that's true though, you mentioned noble gases. And of course, in noble gases, it's, it's well established uh, in the noble gas community that there were um, that there are galactic cosmic ray effects. Of course, you're right. Um, and noble gas studies had been applied to chronometers like tung the tungsten hafnium tungsten system, for example. But there's a problem there, which is that noble gases are undergoing uh, a spallation reaction because of galactic cosmic rays primarily. And that reaction is mostly happening in the outer surface of our meteoroid as it travels through space. Whereas the reaction which is happening to affect platinum isotopes and also tungsten isotopes is a neutron capture reaction. And that happens at much, much lower energy levels. So it happens in the thermal to epithermal energy ranges. And point in our meteoroid, if you imagine your meteoroid traveling through space, the point in our meteoroid where these effects are at their greatest and we see the largest effects for platinum isotopes, the largest offsets for platinum isotopes and the largest effects in tungsten isotopes is actually in the deeper layers of these bodies. So there's a disconnect between our noble gases and our elements like tungsten, which mm. is why noble gases were up in, uh, were, were not totally successful at correcting for these galactic cosmic ray effects. Yeah, that's crazy to think then. That's you know, really deep effects. So I guess, so I suppose, I suppose considering all this information then, it has, it's been a large sort of effort in the community then to go back and revisit all these older reported ages that people have collected up until quite yeah. recently. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So uh, there was um, uh, the group in Münster uh, in Germany, they've done a, a huge amount of work towards this to uh, to reassessing the ages of these iron meteorites. And uh, that's their study that, that 
really excitingly showed that, yeah, we, we can show that all of these bodies, they definitely formed after the formation of CAIs. They definitely weren't differentiating before the formation of CAIs. Um, and uh, kind of that went through the solar system and looked at the ages that these things were, were differentiating uh, and then applied that to their accretion times as well. Yeah. So yeah, super exciting. Yeah. When I use platinum isotopes, uh, I've looked at um, some some less well studied iron meteorite bodies, or uh, yeah, iron meteorite bodies, um, it, including the 1AB iron meteorites. And the 1AB iron meteorites are a really strange one because they're not iron meteorites in the sense that they don't represent the true core of a body. So it's a much more complicated body to, to try and understand than, um, than the, the, the iron meteorites, the magmatic iron meteorites that we talk about so far, those early formed ones. So and sorry, uh, how, how did they form then if they weren't the central cores? That's a really good question, and there's still some debate about okay. it. So the iron meet, uh, the iron meteorites. So the one AB meteorites. Um, there are two proposals for how they formed. The first is that they uh, have formed solely through impacts, and the second is that we're seeing a body which has undergone some internal heating but to a limited extent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that that body's then been impacted so the impact part of this story is really important because one of the the curious things about our 1ab irons is that they contain inclusions of silicates in them so fragments of silicates which have been thrown into the metal and then that metal must have cooled quite rapidly in fact because otherwise we'd expect those fragments of silicates to to kind of sink out but we don't see that so there's some kind of highly energetic process that's gone on that's mixed these these pieces of the, the silicate portions, the outer silicate portions of the body into the metal. And one of the, the ongoing questions in the literature has been whether or not, as I said, there's any role for internal heating in this body. So did it begin to try and differentiate, but the differentiation stalled perhaps because there wasn't enough uh, of those uh, short-lived radionuclides to heat the body and contribute to, to continuing core formation? Or um, perhaps this body formed too late and it was never ever gonna undergo uh, uh, core mantle differentiation due to internal heating and perhaps all of the heating of this body just came from these impact processes and one of the the questions is are we just looking at pools of melt pools of metal melt that were formed on this body as a result of one or multiple impacts and so I started working on this body first through the silicate portions, which are a group of meteorites called the winonites. They're quite a, a rare group of meteorites. Uh, and then I moved on to look at the, the 1AB iron meteorites, which we think are associated with those winonites. And they come from uh, the same body. So if I was to hand you a meteorite now and you wanted to make some measurements of all these different isotopic systems, what sort of instruments would you be using to do that? Yeah, so I work mainly in a clean lab uh, and I use a uh, multi-collector ICPMS or inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometers to make my measurement. So if you handed me a piece of meteorite now, I would start off by having a good look at it, check what's there. Uh, I would remove any edges that were weathered or any fusion crust that was on that meteorite and then I would take it to my lab and I would completely destroy it <laughs> so don't hand me anything that you care about <laughs> so what we do in the clean lab is we uh, we apply different acids uh, and we we heat our samples and we completely destroy them we want to break them down to get the chemistry inside them um, and then when we want to measure our isotope ratios, it's really, really important for us to purify the elements we're interested in. So, for example, when I measure platinum, 
I need to purify platinum as much as I can from the neighboring elements, osmium and iridium, because those will interfere when I try and make my isotopic measurements. And I do this through um, an ion exchange process. So we have a, a column, so uh, basically a, a long, thin tube which we fill with uh, a resin. So resin are plastic beads, basically, which have an affinity for different elements in different strength acids. Um, and so we can use this to exchange our, our ions in our sample um, onto this resin or off this resin to try and purify the elements that we're interested in. And once I've purified the elements that I'm interested in, so mainly platinum, then I go downstairs to, to our multi-collector ICPMS and I make my isotope measurements with that. I guess what's really cool about the sort of column method, I suppose, at the end of it all, you've got a small Teflon pot, I suppose, with like PPB or PPM amounts of uh, metal. It must be quite weird to think that you've got such a minute amount of Purified. That's true. Yeah, you start off um, with a reasonably large amount of, of meteorite and then you separate out the relatively small amount of platinum that, that it's made up of, for example. And one of the cool things that we worked on in Zurich, though, is trying to, uh, and, and also, I mean, anybody who works on meteorites does this, is try and really like maximize what you get out of your meteorites. So when I put my meteorite through the column, I'm not just separating platinum. Uh, so the platinum study is a, a companion study to uh, a palladium study that my PhD student Matthias Eck completed. And so we could actually separate palladium and platinum from the same column at different points in the, the routine. And that's actually really, aside from being economical for how we use our meteorites, that's really, really important because palladium is also affected by these galactic cosmic ray effects. and if we don't use the same piece of material to measure palladium and platinum, which we want to use to correct those GCR effects, then we can end up with uh, like a discrepancy, an offset between the correction we want to make and the correction that we actually make. So if we took two separate pieces of meteorite and got palladium isotopes off one and platinum isotopes off the other, we might find that the galactic cosmic ray effect in those two pieces was different. And what we measure and try to apply with our platinum is not actually adequate for the palladium isotopes that we've measured. Yeah, I guess that's an interesting point, really, I suppose. So uh, using the sort of the, the, the dosometer method and all that kind of stuff, are you able to then sort of have a good estimate of where where that meteorite that you're looking at came from in the original pair of body or is that still a bit of an unknown yeah you can have a go at that definitely um you can make some some predictions about how deep within the, the mm -hmm. body um your meteorite must have originated. So there's a really nice set of models by Ingo Leo, who's based in Bern, and he models the offsets you would get, for example, for platinum isotopes, but for many other isotope systems too. And he looks at this uh, relative to the initial size of that meteoroid as it travels through space, and also the depth beneath the surface of each kind of packet of the meteorite. Um, but there are... Um, it's a little bit difficult to do that because there are, for most meteorites, a lot of unknowns. Like we don't really know exactly how large those meteoroids were as they were traveling through space. So we have to kind of make an assumption about that if we wanted to say how deep our portion of meteorite might have come from. But one of the, the key things with these GCR effects, which we see with platinum and tungsten and palladium, all of these systems, is that you only need to move like a couple of centimeters within your meteoroid and you can measure a different galactic cosmic ray offset. And we have a really cool meteorite, uh, meteorite um, at ETH, which is called Carbo. So Carbo is a 2D. And uh, when Carbo fell, um, scientists who found it kind of cut it into a series of bars with very, very well described depths, positions beneath or positions within that meteor mm -hmm. meteorite. Um, and, and 
we have some of those bars at ETH Zurich. And when you measure different places on these bars, you can see, you can measure these different platinum isotope offsets. So these different uh, effects of galactic cosmic rays across this kind of single meteorite, meteorite which is only kind of, I guess, this big or so. It's not, not yeah. really huge. So. Wow, super sensitive. That's why I get yeah. the highlights of why it's important to do this, and I suppose. Yeah, exactly, and why it's important to do it as carefully as you can. So really, if you can get your um, your dosimeter, for example, like platinum, if you can measure that on the same uh, piece of material as the, the isotope that you want to correct for galactic cosmic ray effects in, then you'll end up with a better answer. Yeah. So I imagine samples like that are really useful for then developing models to work yes. out the offsets. Yes, exactly. They're, they're really, really useful for, for developing our models to try and work out what's actually going on and to, to try and calibrate some of the, the, the models. I said there's a really uh, great model by Ingo Leia. Um, and so studies of Carbo uh, allow us to kind of see where there are differences between that model and what we actually measure in nature. So for example, one of the, the differences between what we measure in our meteorites and these models is that although the models like basically perfectly predict the, the slope of the correlation between our dosimeter and our other element or between different ratios of platinum isotopes, it often under predicts the actual magnitude of the effect that we think there should be based on the um, the exposure ages which have been predetermined through noble gas studies, for example. So yeah, they're, they're really useful for a kind of allowing a double check and a calibration. Um, probably a very obvious elephant in the room. Um, what's your Zoom background that you're using at the moment? What's, uh, what sample is that? Or <laughs> what features can we see in that? <laughs> Did you turn uh, and look at it? Yes, I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh no, that, no. Uh, that is an iron meteorite. I can't actually remember offhand which one it is. Uh, what we can see here is, uh, I don't know if you can, you can't see my mouse either. Uh, so what we can see in, in the background is kind of here. Mm -hmm. there's, there's this dark uh, inclusion here. So this is a, a sulfide in this meteorite. And then you can see these um, like uh, laminations here on it as well, coming this way yeah. and this way. This is called a Widmanstatten pattern. And this is formed when the, the meteorite cools. Um, so iron meteorites, uh, they all have some, some kind of um, version of this, or mostly have some kind of version of this pattern. But its actual um, shape depends on both the composition and the rate at which the meteorite has cooled. So these are like individual metal crystals. Mm -hmm. um, and as the, the meteorite cools slowly between about, I think, 700 and 500 degrees C, um, we get these, these kind of structures forming. Uh, and although most iron meteorites should, should show these patterns, um, to actually reveal them, we have to treat the, the meteorite in some light acid, so some very weak acid. So when we just, if we just cut the surface of a meteorite, we wouldn't see this pattern. But once the, the meteorite has been etched lightly with acid, these, these Widman statin patterns are revealed. Um, and yeah, they're, they're really useful for telling us about the, the rates of cooling that these meteorites have undergone. Uh, and also, uh, for people who like to collect meteorites, uh, these patterns are very, I guess, they're, they're one of the very attractive things about iron meteorites. Mm. <laughs> but I can't remember offhand which meteorite this is. It's either one called Gibeon or one called Cape York, and I have no idea. <laughs> Either way, I mean, they're very pretty meteorites for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, love a, I'd love a piece of nicely polished on my mantle. Yeah, so. they're very nice. Yeah. <laughs> so you know you're saying you can use them to, uh, again, understanding how quickly a meteorite has cooled, or, or the iron part, at least, of the meteorite is cooled. Um, you know, earlier we were discussing, and unfortunately I can't remember the group name of those iron meteorites are, the ones where we're unsure whether they were just pockets of, of metal mm -hmm. that's melted. Um, could you not use them in that situation to 
to get an understanding of whether it was an impact event or whether it was a pockets of iron within a within a meteorite that just didn't heat enough for it to go to the center or something like that. Yeah, and that's exactly one of the things that I've been working on, so we can do that. The The meteorites that um, I was talking about are the 1AB irons, that's it, yeah. and I've worked on um, both the hafnium tungsten systems, so of course, again, we need to co correct the, the tungsten information with the platinum, uh, the tungsten isotope ratios with platinum isotopes for this galactic cosmic ray effect. And then what we were able to show is that uh, so, so this this body, I should explain first. Uh, this this one AB iron body um, has what we think represent different pools of metals. So, pieces of metal which we think come from the same body, uh, all from this one AB iron body, but that have um, slightly different elemental compositions which means that they haven't formed together right. as one single core or one single body of metal uh, and so that's how this idea that they might um, relate to individual impacts so each of these like separate metal bodies could be a separate impact uh, that's where that idea kind of comes from um, and the other idea is that this was one body which began to form a core um, but then for some reason it stalled and these these metal portions which had already melted were left kind of stranded in the the mantle of that body and were then kind of redistributed through this impact process that we know must have happened um, so what we did or what um, a study that I led at ETH Zurich was to look at the hafnium tungsten isotope ratio, so the tungsten isotope ratio uh, of these different pieces of metal from these different pools. And what we were looking to see was whether or not they gave us the same age or not. And what we found was that these different pools on this body did give us the same age for hafnium uh, tungsten differentiation, so core mantle differentiation. And we argued that this meant that this was probably one core separation event even though the the core didn't truly form this was one event rather than multiple impacts over an extended period and recently we've been extending that study further to look at the times that those uh, metal portions of that body cooled and we've been doing that using the palladium silver chronometer so palladium is decaying uh, 107 palladium is decaying to 107 silver. I hope that's right. I might check that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so palladium is decaying to silver, and um, and this allows us to to date the the core cooling age of that that metal portion of the body. And again, this is another chronometer which needs. Um, to be corrected for the effect of galactic cosmic rays with the platinum isotopes. Uh, and once we've done that, we can again show that this body cooled uh, basically as one. All these different pools of metal have cooled together uh, in the same time frame. Yeah. And again, if we had different pockets of melt on that body which had been formed through different impacts and were perhaps different sizes formed at slightly different times because the impacts weren't if the impacts weren't concurrent then that's not the result we would expect to find so i would argue that the the evolution of the 1ab parent body so that the body these these 1ab irons comes from includes uh, a stage of subdued uh, core mantle differentiation in its kind of early stages of its history and that afterwards that body uh, began to cool and then underwent this impact event and it was one giant impact which scrambled the body all together and then that body cooled as a single unit afterwards. So palladium and silver they can be used as a chronometers for how quickly the core mantle cooled is that correct yes that's correct 
Um, so palladium and silver are fractionated from each other um, as, as a core cools, basically. So as it begins to crystallize, one is um, compatible in the, the crystal and the other in the melt. And so we get this fractionation between each other. And that's what allows us to draw our isochrons, which is what we need to be able to do in able, uh, in able to, to be able to work out the, uh, the, the age, basically, that these things happened. And when we're discussing ages there, what's the type of precision we're getting to? Hmm, that's a good question. So firstly, when we discuss ages, we're discussing them for these short-lived chronometers relative to uh, the formation of CAIs. Right, okay. And for the palladium silver system, this is actually a little bit tricky because what we need to know then is what was the initial distribution of palladium isotopes mm -hmm. in the solar system. So how much of the radioactive palladium isotope 107 palladium was present in the solar system at the point when it formed? Because then we work relative to that and say, OK, well, we know how quickly it's going to decay. We know what the half-life should be. Uh, so if we measure this ratio of palladium uh, or if, if this rock formed with this ratio of palladium 107 to palladium 108 for example then uh, we should know what age or what what that means in terms of how how much later after the beginning of the solar system that happened but for the palladium silver system we have two estimates for um for what the, the initial composition of the solar system was. So how much of this radiogenic 107 palladium isotope was present? And that does hamper what we do, I have to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so something as well that I'm trying to uh, refine using the studies that I'm doing at the moment. So see if we can place any additional constraints on what might be this initial solar system uh, value for, for this chronometer. Um, and then for the precision, well, for the silver palladium system, uh, we can get really precise data. But I have to say that even though we're really good at making this galactic cosmic ray correction, it can or it does increase the uncertainty. So there's, of course, an uncertainty on the platinum data that we produce. And then when we want to really try and work out the ages of these uh, events happening in the solar system, that means we have to take into account the uncertainty on the platinum isotope system and what we're measuring with our silver isotopes as well for the palladium silver chronometer. So it's possible to get really precise data with uncertainties of like say maybe 0.2 million years. Oh wow, okay. Um, but if we're unlucky and we uh, have samples which have been really, really strongly exposed to galactic cosmic rays, for example, mm -hmm. then our uncertainties tend to go up. And so they can be more like plus or minus uh, a million years or, or so. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a, a bit variable. It really depends on, on the samples we're working on. Yeah. I mean, that's still amazing considering yeah. how far back in time you're going yeah. with this. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And I mean, this is also a bit more of a problem yeah. for the palladium silver system. Uh, when we talk about the ages that we obtain with uh, the hafnium tungsten system, then a lot of the uncertainties for those are really, 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 really small. Mm -hmm. Again, considering that we're talking about events which happens, say, maybe a million years after the formation yeah. of the, the solar system. It's uh, really crazy how how well we can pinpoint the ages of these things. Yeah. So perhaps a more general question then. So, you, you know, you, we've learned all this cool stuff about iron meteorites, but how analogous do we think these processes and these ages are in terms of thinking about how, you know, our own core on Earth formed? I mean, are they, are they related or the fact that they're sort of failed planetesimals preclude them for understanding the Earth? So, I mean, the 1AB irons are very interesting because because they've undergone this process where they've begun to differentiate but for some reason that process hasn't stopped hasn't completed then we've basically got a body which is caught mid differentiation mm. and it's one of the very few examples we we have of a body that we think is uh, is displaying that feature that texture so we get kind of veins of metal running through silicate parts and uh yeah um lots of other kind of weird textures in them as well um and otherwise i mean 
bodies like this, these early form planetesimals, they're they're potentially like the the building, or they may have contributed as the, the building blocks to the Earth. Um, seeing as we can't actually sample our own core as well, they give us some idea of, of what that might be, I guess, in terms of its composition. Although because the Earth formed at much, much greater pressures and temperatures than, than these small planetesimals that, that we're looking at, that the iron meteorites derive from. In fact, the Earth's core probably has a, a relatively different composition from most of our meteorites. Mm -hmm. But they, they still, yeah, they're one of the kind of best representations of, of what we could expect for our core. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah sorry, I, I feel like there's something else I meant to say and I forgot it halfway through, but um there we go. I I, I guess I just have, I, I'm just looking at the time. So I um we normally have a, one more question, but if you guys don't mind me asking another question about this partially differentiated yeah. body. Yeah. Um so this partially differentiated body that these meteorites have come from. Mm -hmm. Um do you think that's down to the size of the body or was it down to the amount of radioactive material present within it? And that's... I guess if the latter, why would that be the case that it would, only, it would have just not enough, whereas some other bodies would have enough to differentiate? That's a great question. So what we think the history of this body looks like is that it probably accreted later than mm -hmm. other bodies. Mm -hmm. And because it accreted later, it contained less mm -hmm. of the short-lived radio uh, nuclides, like uh, aluminium-27, for example, that uh, need to decay to produce heat. Um, so we think this body may be accreted around 1.4 or 1.5 million years after the beginning of the solar system. And that it probably had a reasonable size. Mm. So anything bigger than sort of 60 to 100 kilometers in radius. Um, but, but there just was never enough of these short lived mm. Uh, radionuclides to, to really heat it and to, to allow it to form a true core. Um, yeah. So, Alison, how did you become meteorite destroyer, meteorite <laughs> time traveller? How, how did you get to where you are today? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm British and I did my degree, my undergraduate degree at Durham University, and I found that I had a uh, big interest in, in um, geochemistry. So I decided that I would do a PhD that I wanted to carry on with some more research. And at that point, I moved to the Open University in Milton Keynes. And I did a PhD, which was to look at the composition of small volcano uh, volcanic rocks, so very small scale volcanoes in Central Asia, and to try and relate like the composition of those those very small scale uh, uh, volcanic uh, eruptions um, to the underlying tectonics in the region. So I was focused on on volcanoes that were centered in Mongolia, and the regions kind of caught between uh, the effects of the India-Asia collision and maybe some effect of, of subduction around the Pacific margins. Once I'd finished my PhD, um, I was lucky enough to be offered a, a postdoc at the Natural History Museum to mm. start looking at meteorites. And that's when I started to look at these winonite meteorites, which are related to the 1ABs and this body, which has undergone partial differentiation. Um, and I'd always had an interest in, in like cosmochemistry and planetary science. Uh, and what I discovered when I started to do that project was that all of the skills I'd acquired looking and trying to interpret um, my volcanic rocks, so terrestrial samples, they were all completely relevant and the, the skills that I needed to be able to work with meteorites. So I was at the Natural History Museum for two years and after that I moved to Switzerland to ETH in Zurich and that's where I've been ever since and 
my career has uh, yeah, included looking at lots of different meteorite groups uh, with different isotope systems while I've been here. And I've been lucky enough to supervise uh, a couple of PhD students and master's students as well along the way. So. Amazing. Well, it's always nice to hear. I feel lots of people going into planetary science PhDs, they go, oh, well, I've not learned about this before. Um, but you do, it's, you know, you pick it up as we've all done ourselves. Um, so it's good to hear that, you know, all the skills, they just carry over really nicely. I think so, yeah. I think I was struck by the fact that I'd spent all my time doing my PhD trying to make sure that I wasn't really looking at the effects of weathering or something like that. And when I started to work on meteorites, I still had exactly the same problem. Mm -hmm. Like, is this the effect of terrestrial weathering? Is this because I've measured a fusion crust? Like, are we really seeing what the pristine signature of that rock is? And then all of the, the tools that we apply to, to measure those things things in the lab are the same as what we use for terrestrial rocks so it's the same techniques it's just uh, uh, much older rocks <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um well we've covered quite we've gone on quite the journey through time <laughs> um but unfortunately we're coming to the end of the episode now and we do have one final question for you that we ask all of our guests uh which is if you could be doing anything else um, academic or non-academic for your career, what would you want to do? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I guess, um, well, I like research and I like earth sciences. So I think if I wasn't looking at meteorites right now, then I would probably still be uh, researching something about uh, volcanism and the interplay between uh, plate tectonics and, and volcanism basically and, and how the earth formed and yeah I guess also I mean questions about the early earth I really like that as well I think that's super interesting so if I wasn't a planetary science then I uh, a scientist then I would probably still be a, a, a terrestrial geochemist I think <laughs> absolutely sounds pretty good yeah <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Alison. This has been really, really interesting. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, so yes, for anyone listening at home, if you'd like any more Earth and Planetary Science content, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All the links are on the screen or in the episode description. Uh, but in the meantime, everybody take care of yourself. And thanks again, Alison. See you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.